Welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. In this podcast, we discuss mystical works of literature and how they relate to recovery. We hope you enjoy today's podcast episode. Hello, this is Buddy C. Welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. We're happy to have Sensei here today, Sensei Elliston, Marla, Dennis, and Carrie, and Lou. Good to have you guys. Today, we'll be talking about the 15th verse of, don't forget about, we have our Facebook group and our nightly AA meeting, all those things. You can find all that at uh, Has a, There's a resources tab there. So if you need any recovery helps, uh, have a lot of things there for you that you're welcome to put to use, welcome to put to use. Um, Today we'll be in the 15th verse of the Tao Te Ching. We'll be hearing from Sensei as to how this would relate to Zen, uh, not only historically, but uh, I want to hear a little bit of Sensei's relationship to this as far as from his experience, because we think this is a very, very uh, uh, Zen filled verse, uh, especially the last stanza. So, Good to have you today, sir. What have you been up to, Sensei? Catch us up. Uh, well, working on a lot of things. Uh, strangely enough, the COVID seemed to make us more active than the pandemic, more active than ever. We've gone a lot online, as everybody has. But we were well prepared to do it, thanks to our online tech team. They had our websites all up and running. We'd moved to brand new servers and all of that before the COVID hit. We've had a robust program. We have, uh, we're still having in-person sitting six o'clock to seven each morning, Monday through Friday. I, I've been going to those because we have a resident Vietnamese nun and uh, she wants to learn all of our protocols. She was at Upaya Zen Center for some time and she's doing her, um, at Emory, she's doing her um, chaplaincy type of program through Emory. And uh, she'll be here through June as a resident and uh, she'll be giving talks and things of that nature at some point. And then she says she thinks she wants to stay for another year. So she may end up being a long-term resident. And we're, we have a second uh, manuscript we're wrapping up by the 17th this month. And uh, Randy and I are working on a third uh, about the intersection of design thinking and Zen free digital. And then he's going to be developing a post-digital version of it. A book that he may author. In design, we we learn to spend most of our time on defining the problem. The theory is if you have a thoroughgoing definition of the problem, the solution will be inherent in the definition. So we don't try to leap to a solution. We try to we spend all our time and effort in define what is the problem. And often we redefine the problem back to the client. That's part of your job. So here, Buddha defined a problem. I think we all have to reinvent Zen and Taoism for ourselves. We have to redefine that problem for our time and place. And that's the main challenge I think we face. And probably I would think Zen and design would be, or with any problem is realizing that you already have a solution to your problem and you just haven't, Pretty much. Don't, don't know it yet, right? You, you haven't defined the problem yet, actually. Yes. And so yes. if you do, you'll see you have the solution. And things yeah. like simplicity, we'll talk about simplicity. You know, simplicity is high value in Zen, difficult to achieve. And what I've done, too, since a, a, a link to your book is on the front page of BuddyC.org for folks that would okay. that have not Thanks. purchased it yet. Good. And then also a link to your podcast is on the podcast page at BuddyC.org. Oh, cool, so, cool. So we have a second podcast that y'all might be interested in. It's called Householder. And uh, those are basically dialogues, interviews between John Mitchell, the guy who produces the podcast, and anybody that wants to be interviewed who's you know pursuing a householder life, trying to establish a practice. And Taoism is so similar to Zen, it would be appropriate for you guys too, but it's mostly about how do we how do we have a real a legitimate or functioning Zen practice in the midst of householder responsibilities, taking care of kids and cars and cats and dogs and you know all the stuff we have to do? 
how do you how do you make that work? So the Householder podcast is is an interesting one too. And there's some good ones. There's some good ones on there. I'll check it out, and I'll I'll also put a link for that on the podcast page as well. Yeah, Householders, it's called. It's on our podcast page next to mine. Before I forget, Craig, I'm glad you were able to show up today. I've gotten a lot of feedback from last week's more than normal. Everyone enjoying last week's podcast. Since last week we talked about, is it okay to make goals and plans and and practice a Taoist philosophy at the same time? Is that possible? Probably as long as you don't get too attached to them. And that's you know, exactly it. Yeah, compulsive about it. Matsuoka used to say, "Your projects are important." He'd say, "Your yeah. projects are important." We have to make plans. That's not a. It's not a problem with making plans. The problem is. What do we expect from those plans? You know, right. So, right. Well, now, is that reasonable? Right. Yeah. Reasonable expectation. Actually, the thing I heard over and over was everyone's comments were very good and that Craig was unseasonably quiet. So it was an excellent podcast. So, they were... <laughs> so Craig, just keep that in mind. Okay. But is golden silence. Yes. <laughs> Let the moss grow over your mouth. Okay, the 15th verse, I'm just going to read the uh, Jonathan Starr translation. And then if you guys want to pull from one of, the, uh, one of the others or any of the translations, it's fine. The masters of this ancient path are mysterious and profound. Their interstate baffles all inquiry. Their depths go beyond all knowing. Thus, despite every effort, We can only tell of their outer signs. Deliberate, as if treading over the stones of a winter brook. Watchful, as if meeting danger on all sides. Reverent, as if receiving an honored guest. Selfless, like a melting block of ice. Pure, like an uncarved block of wood. Accepting like an open valley. Through the course of nature, muddy water becomes clear. Through the unfolding of life, man reaches perfection. Through sustained activity, that supreme rest is naturally found. Those who have Tao want nothing else. Those seemingly empty, they are never full. Oh, I'm sorry. Those seemingly empty, they are ever full. Those seemingly old, they're beyond the reach of birth and death. I've got that marked from my epitaph on my tombstone, unless I come across something better. That last phrase, those who have yeah. Tao want nothing else. Those seemingly empty, they are ever full. Those seemingly old, they're beyond the reach of birth and death. Don't y'all think that's a good, that's a great epitaph for a tombstone, I think. That's really beautiful. That's where I'll win. We're going to cremate you, though, buddy. Yeah, but I'm going to have to have a place for the grandkids to come see. And I'm going to, I want to have a bench and an eternal flame so they can come roast hot dogs on Sunday afternoon and visit me at the same time. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> you I've, like been that? Collect, I've been collecting epitaphs for my tombstone. Not that I'll have one, but one is work in progress. <laughs> yes. His work was never done and still isn't, right? <laughs> I found an old coffee can from our home group, actually. It says special blend on it. That's where I want my ashes in it. And I actually think I want part of that ashes flushed in a, in a public toilet. I don't really care at that point. So uh, it would be amazing. Uh, okay. Thoughts on this verse, guys? Yeah, closed for repairs. That's good, Luke. Uh, any, any opening thoughts? Before we hear from Sensei on this, um, it's interesting how he's talking about there uh, that we can only tell of the outer signs. In other words, we can only describe what the Tao is like, what this path is like. We really can't define it. So all these things they're talking about being deliberate and watchful and reverent, and selfless and pure and accepting or some of the translations that we have up here, they're saying things like 
alert and courteous and fluid and shapeable, clear. Uh, it's just a description, like describing to someone what a strawberry tastes like without them experiencing it. That's how I think about it. It's just a description. We, we, we really are incapable of really explaining it. We can only describe what it looks like. Yeah, and there's kind of a, know, not a challenge, but a question that goes with it, too, because it says, here's here's what the masters were like. We can only describe it. And then it switches to, um, what about you? Do you have the patience to do it? Can you wait for that kind of openness? Can you sit quietly? So it's an interesting teaching <clears throat> style or teaching point is to talk about how the masters were and then reflect it back to the listener. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, thank you, Lou. You know, and, and and the example they give is, can you wait patiently and let your mud settle until the water's clear? I've heard other translations of that say, uh, can you wait and allow the mud to settle so the right answer appears by itself? The answer is already there. It's in the mud. If we just leave it alone, we'll, we'll eventually see it. There's nothing that needs to be added. According to this, the way I see it, we, we just have to wait. Are we able to wait and just sit and just let it appear by itself without our push and force? You know what, what uh, it, it occurs to me, a cartoon I saw of a couple of buzzards sitting there and one buzzard says to the other, wait hell, I'm going to kill somebody. <laughs> yes. Ah, and it never works out. It doesn't for me. Well, there are times when uh, patience is much more difficult than other times. <laughs> but I think we, we in meditation, at least in Zen, we learn patience on the cushion. You, If you sit through a retreat, you know, and buddy, you've done this, you've got to develop an awful lot of patience with yourself, with your own monkey mind, with your own monkey business and everything. And just, you know, oh, here we go again, and put up with it. And then I think what happens is when you leave the cushion, you have more patience with other people, your circumstances in life and so forth. That seems, if you've ever gone off on a, a kind of a life-changing experience, and some people for vac vacation is sometimes that for some people, they come back and your familiar old house is just so weird to you when you come back, if you've been away long enough. I was on a three-month ongo in Austin one year. And when I came back, it was like another world. And it was just just having been, I guess if you went, if you, I was never drafted and, and never went to the military, but I, I guess if you go overseas, you know, the military and come back, it's the same thing. It's like re-entry problem. In, in the LSD days, they call it re-entry problem. You know, you drop the acid next morning, you got a re-entry problem. So... I think our zazen, can, our, our meditation, however you do your meditation, can be like that. Uh, Okamura called it, Okamura She said, it's like a mini vacation. You take a little vacation from everything. But, of course, we recommend pretty long sits, 30, 40 minutes, and so forth, to get over the hump. You have to sort of get over a hump. And if you quit too soon, it doesn't. it does accumulate over time. But if you quit too soon, I think maybe... Uh, and Matsuoka would often say that largest cohort of Americans or Westerners in general who practice Zazen quit too soon. So, but if you grow up in Japan and it's just part of the woodwork, I don't think it's as effective as it is for us. If you grew up in China with Taoism, you know, you are voluntarily adopting this. If you grow up with that and your parents are Taoists, you know, it's a different, different thing. Do they practice the same kind? I know that you may not know the answer to this. Uh, the I don't know really how to phrase it. What we're learning from Taoist philosophy, the Chinese I have met may be familiar with Taoism, but they don't practice this. The ones I know don't. They push yeah, as much yeah. as I do, or used to for sure. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, yeah. I, I don't. I don't know. Um, I want to go and see some of the sites, but uh, I don't know if uh, I know that if I go, I'm I'm going to do my best not to high, have high expectations of seeing, you know, seeing yeah. a higher level, you know. Yeah. 
I, I don't know much about Taoism. I was on a, Mer- a panel at Mercer University where they brought a Taoist and a Zen priest and I think a Confucianist from China had come over. This was some international program. And I and I think a Catholic Monsignor were invited to be, part, you know, part, give a presentation. And uh, the, the Taoists had a couple of American students that he had some kind of contact with. Uh, I was not profoundly impacted by his talk. It's somewhere where I've got a book. They published a book. And uh, that might be interesting. But if you send me a note, maybe I could uh, send you that book or send you the title of the book. And you could. It's, it's a Mercer publication, Mercer University. But, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, in the old countries of origin, it's kind of like Catholicism in Italy. You know, I mean, would you really, would it be a creative initiative thing for you to do to become a Catholic priest in Italy? Not really, you know. I wouldn't want to be a Zen monk in Japan or a priest. You know, well, it's you just, experienced that in Japan, didn't you, Sensei, when you went over, because you, you got to experience uh uh, Zen from that perspective when you, when you went and visited? Yeah, I've been a couple of times. I've been a couple of times. Went in 1987 and went back in 2015 on the video documentary. First time was not very, went there very long, three three weeks. But the second time was a really hectic three weeks running around videoing everything. But you get the, there was, I think it was Rousseau, the philosopher, who talked about the weight of custom, you know, how this is back in the uh, early days of the colonialism where they were bringing the native Americans over to Europe and showing them off and things like that. And they were getting much more information coming back from around the world about how people lived everywhere. And he, he pointed out that the way they lived in Europe uh, was just custom. That's not the way people live around the world. And he had all these examples, but he talked about the weight of custom, the situation you're born into has this, massive weight to it you either conform or or not you know but uh i in japan it's so oppressive i mean you go up to see those old monasteries in the mountains they were built by hand my granddad is a house builder and i think he had a craftsman table saw at the end of his life but he you know they built houses by hand but these damn things they have the the floorboards like four inches thick 18 inches wide, and they run the length of the temple. How did they do that, you know, without flying saucers and lasers and <laughs> getting some help from aliens somehow? Uh, it's just overwhelming. And and if you're a priest there, you're carrying that. That's your legacy. You know? Here, you know, we've got a little more wiggle room, I think. Fortunate for us, you know. And Taoism is the same. I'm pretty sure if you go back to its roots in China, you're going to find a pretty oppressive legacy there. Now, now, Sensei, how many years have you been sitting? Started about the mid-60s, so that's coming up on... 55, 56 years if it's 65. I know that. Approaching 60 years, yeah. So so you've been uh, (laughs) meditating as long as I've been alive, so... Wow. All the good it's done, right? But not constantly. When I came here, it's 1970. For about three years, I didn't practice at all. I was reestablishing really? my life and all kinds of things. And one day I just sat down again. It was no big deal. It was like time. And uh, about 74, I started teaching at the Cliff Valley Way Unitarian. So I sort of segued back into it. But it was new business, new, you know, I, I was divorced. A lot of the things that a lot of you have gone through reconstituting my life entirely so i took a hiatus i think it's better if you do that once in a while because when you come back you know what you missed yeah (laughs) you find out but this idea of finding the solution within the stillness though never changes i don't think i think that's the for me that's the essence of this verse is that the solution's in the stillness yeah, and in, in Zen, it's called mokurai. It's a Chinese term. It means stillness in motion, motion in stillness. It doesn't mean that there's any such absolute thing as stillness. But if you enter into deeper and deeper stillness, 
the kind of motion you experience, experience, you could say is on a different level, kind of like Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. You're moving into a cellular level. You're moving into a, you know, chemical or I don't know what you, how you would describe it. Oh, it's a different kind of stillness, right? Since it's not the stillness we think of us just, Granted, we right. may be sitting still, but the but the result of that is an inner stillness. Right, right. Oh. Everything is is called samadhi. Is a jargon term. Samadhi. You all heard the term. It means centered, balanced. Everything is in samadhi. Chickens, dogs, cats, and cows, stones, trees. Everything is in a kind of stillness. And uh, we human beings, you know, think too much, worry too much run around like all the things he's describing here is what would be characteristic of a master. Well, it's, that's the natural state to be that way, the way, what the description that they're giving here. And we are all that way, uh, according to this principle, but we have learned to be frenetic. You know, we have learned, we've been trained and conditioned to chase after things. And so Buddha is described as something like pulling out the root. And we think of it like a kudzu root, you know, really big and heavy and really in, stuck in the ground uh, or kicking down the ridge pole that holds up the house, the roof. The whole house has to come crashing in. And so getting back to the original mind or getting back to this native stillness is not considered easy by any means. Uh, and it is a process of unlearning, you might say, unlearning what we think we know. So it's it's counterintuitive. It's countercultural. I mean, if you look at the culture, it's just a madhouse, you know, mm. of the opposite of what they're describing. Here. Yeah, yeah. I think Dennis has a question. What do you, what do you have? I do, especially when we are talking about meditation. So when I when I sit for longer than than ten minutes, I like to use my mala beats. But I can't help myself for thinking that I'm cheating because besides <laughs> my breath, I also have that from uh, having less of a monkey mind. Yeah, yeah. Does that make any sense? What do you think about yeah, that? It does. <laughs> some, some temples actually discourage you from carrying your bees into the zendo so that you don't sit there and fidget with them. Yeah. Uh, we used to use the wrist type mala in uh, Chicago and uh, since I just had us lay it in our palms. So we hold our hands like that and the beads would just wrap around. But there is a tendency, a temptation to sort of wiggle them. They used to use them as a rosary and counting off mm. 108, 108 gates of Dharma illumination, that type of thing. Um, so the teachings like count the breath, observe the breath, uh, et cetera, are considered provisional. Uh, they're like doing push-ups or like doing, uh, if you are playing an instrument and you're learning an instrument, you learn to play scales. Scales are not music, but what they develop your strength, they develop your persistence, they, et cetera, et cetera. So you, the subroutines, if you think of method, like we have method in everything we do, every profession has method. The method in Zen is primarily Zazen meaning sit still, you know, sit, sit upright, sit still. And then there's subroutines like counting the breath that are techniques, you might say, that, are, that support the method. But eventually they're, they're meant to be transcended in the sense that if you get to this point of the description of these masters, you don't really need to be sitting there counting your breath anymore. But it's not like you've reached any stage of anything major accomplishment. It's just that uh, that skillful means or expedient means for you to train yourself. Counting the breath is only a way of getting us to pay attention to our breath. It's a way of working with the monkey mind that wants to go off and do something else, right? It's bored, mm -hmm. boring. This is boring. And so counting gives the monkey mind something to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we experiment. I've been experimenting and teach helping you know, encouraging all the people who talk with me to experiment. Instead of counting from, say, zero, one of the recommendations is count, count your breath on the inhalation, count from zero to 10. 
and start over. So I say, count down, count from ten, nine down to zero. That's 10, right? Nine to zero. And if you count down, there's a different psychology. It's like all these spaceships going off here recently, right? Count, count down to the blast off. So the psychology is we're counting down to something. What are we counting down to, right? When you reach zero, that question of zero is, is there in front of your face. What, what is zero? <laughs> you know, count it down to zero. So you're sitting at ground zero, right? And um, all of these techniques, in other words, these methods that are supplemental to simply sitting upright, sit, sit there quietly and upright and so forth, they're meant to help you mature in your practice just as, you know, you do similar things. You count the reps when you're doing push-ups or calisthenics or aerobics or whatever, yoga, anything you're doing, based on the idea that sheer repetition, the number of reps, how long you stay with it, all of those are crucial to developing any skill or strength. You know, you're not going to develop a lot of strength doing one set of push-ups. So anything you can do to induce yourself to not give up, to keep coming back and keep at it, you know. So many of the sub-routine techniques around sitting are like that. And uh, attitudes is a whole other level, like we're supposed to empty our mind of thoughts. Good luck with that. No, you're not, you know. Uh, some some meditation schools, mindfulness says, sit with your eyes closed. How mindful can that be? So we have very specific instructions in Zen about the posture and about keeping the eyes open, half open, looking down 30, 45 degrees, all of these kind of things. But like pranayama and yoga, where they tell you to inhale for a count, hold for a count, exhale for a count, hold for a count, inhale for a count. We think what, you know, you can take that and try to do that the rest of your life and you would be missing the point. Because I think what happened is those great masters had experienced what, what I like to refer to as the natural breath. This is your natural breath. And it, it definitely slows down as you sit more and more still, as Buddy was saying. Your breath becomes more and more still. Your heartbeat slows down. The mind works, the, the electricity on the brain, everything starts adapting and settling. So I think what they did in giving you those pranayama techniques, the proportions and everything, they didn't mean that to be a oh, bite or dictum, you have to do it this way. But if this was more, this is an approximation of the natural breath. And if you follow this pattern, then you're more likely to start breathing naturally sooner. So if you think of the meditation posture as the natural posture, this is the way people used to sit around a campfire. Or if you were hunting, you had to sit still and quiet for a long period of time and stay alert mm. and so forth. Natural breath, natural posture, eventually natural state of mind, which in Buddhism is very much like Taoism. It's balanced. It's balanced between the monkey mind and what is called Bodhi. Chitta is the monkey mind, Bodhi, wisdom mind. We're simply out of balance. We're way too far over on the side of intellectualization. Cheetah, monkey. So like Chinese medicine, we're just bringing ourselves back into balance by sitting facing a blank wall. We're not giving the monkey anything to think about. <laughs> so eventually it'll go crazy at first, but eventually it'll lie down and take a nap. So is it a goal to, to do it without using any of the five senses uh, in, in the end? Without using them, no, I would say uh, the heart sutra right away directs you to the senses. So given emptiness, no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, no seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking. So what does it mean when we say no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue? So it's directing your attention to the senses, but saying that you don't really understand your own senses. Mm -hmm. Since data is already, you might say, corrupted by the monkey by the survival. Uh, they say for a baby in the crib, Freud's oceanic awareness, everything is a mess. It's just a flow of energy. Can't sort anything out. Then as you grow and mature, you go through individuation where you, you learn, you learn your perception. 
you learn to separate mom out from the background. You learn to separate yourself out from the crib and so forth. So all of this is a learned process. That's why we think of the meditation as an unlearning process. We have to kind of roll, run the tape backwards to get back to our original mind, mm -hmm. where it's not so full of ideas and not so convinced of its own reality. We challenge reality. And, and, it's, and it's not so full of fear either, right? And not so full of fear, moment, right. More right. in the moment, like a child. An infant's yep. in the moment. Yep. Yeah. So is all of nature. It's in the moment. It's not off wondering how it's going to retire in a few years or what's on special at the store or what movie's coming on tonight. You know, it's. Yeah. We were sitting still for an hour and uh, Pearl didn't move. I didn't move. We didn't get up and do the walking in the halfway point. And so I, I, I got to thinking about that. We're sitting still for an hour and. Uh, then uh, I said uh, to myself, I looked up on, you know, Googled <laughs> to find out what I'm talking about. And in that hour, uh, we moved a thousand miles into the Atlantic Ocean by the rotation of the planet here in Atlanta. And uh, the Earth in its orbit moved 67,000 miles in that hour. And the solar system moved 513,000 miles in that hour. And the galaxy, the whole galaxy moved 1.3 million miles in that hour. <laughs> so we, we moved, we start, we ended up somewhere to, to some 2 million miles away from where we started in that hour. <laughs> Guys, how about your personal practice, your sitting practice, uh, any questions for Sensei? That seems like where this discussion is going is that we know from this verse that it's talking about finding our solution in stillness. That was a great question, yeah. Dennis. How about anyone that's any of you guys is starting a, a practice? If you have questions about that too, Marla. Well, now now that I know my meditation practice is a peripheral practice and that I need to uh, to aspire to just sit, um, but for the last um, at least. 100 days i've been doing a i've been doing sound meditations with headphones on and just sitting for like 10 minutes and i also have been using that type of sound to sleep with so when i'm i'm ready to nod off i turn these this sound therapy on and it sends me to sleep which is really all i've been looking for my whole life um Sound meditation makes me feel really good. I, I listen, I try and stay with the vibration from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I know sound, uh, hearing was the sense that uh, most of Buddha's disciples testified was the first to unravel for them. And Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of compassion, is known as the uh, Kuan Yin in China, is known as. Uh, the Bodhisattva of compassion hears the sounds of suffering of the world and becomes enlightened through hearing alone. So Buddha taught that the senses are like knots tied in a scarf. Uh, the scarf running through, the silk scarf running through, is the undifferentiated consciousness running through all the senses. They're differentiated into seeing, differentiated into hearing, differentiated into feeling, and so forth. So he said that uh, our meditation practice is like untying one knot. You can't untie them all at once. So you, you find one that will unravel, and then the rest of them start to come apart. So it's a little bit like deconstructing your own consciousness. Listening to sound, there's no, no problem with any of these techniques at all. Uh, there's, no do, there's no right or wrong. Uh, there's no do's and don'ts, so to speak. But over the centuries or over the you know, development of Zen, through, uh, from we claim to transmit Buddha's meditation, um, there's been a lot of refinement. And so uh, Dogen would say, uh, listen to the chanting of the universe. The universe is constantly chanting the sutras. Don't you hear them? Now, uh, and another poem by Dogen, uh, 
He said, penetrating the meaning of the sutra, meaning the Lotus Sutra, the last teaching, attributed to be the last teaching of Buddha, even the sounds of the marketplace are chanting, are expounding the Dharma. So in Zen, we don't, we don't do, we don't recommend or it's not part of our pedagogy to do sound meditation with recorded sound. Uh, I come from a musical family, so I'm, you know, really into music and sound. And I love the sound of rain. You know, I mean, there's natural sounds like that. And I, I turn a fan on in my bedroom. So I have, a, I have like a white sound that I sleep to. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, yeah. And I don't do it always, but you know, it's. I live in the city, and there's random noises that happen, and I'm a light sleeper, and so they wake me up. But in general, we we tune into the sound that we're hearing, and in a zendo at the center, uh, it's it's pretty isolated. It's like in a woody patch right here in the mid- middle of the city, and there's a big park next to it. And so it's relatively quiet until the dump the trash trucks come and empty <laughs> the dumpsters. And then it's then it's pretty interesting. Sounds like war of the worlds out there. But generally, Zendo is kept very quiet. And uh, little sounds like the fan turning on the heat or the a, a, air conditioning that usually doesn't bother you. But if you can hear a human voice talking in a language you understand, that can be very distracting. And so we try to have moderate, moderate level of sound, just as we have a moderate temperature, moderate light level, right? Not too hot, not too cold, all that kind of thing. So I would, uh, there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but what you might want to do once in a while is try meditating without the sound and listen to the sound of your own body. If, If you sit in a quiet place, you actually start hearing your heartbeat, and you hear your heartbeat all the time. The brain just shuts it off. Doesn't need to know unless your heart stops beating. Then it really needs to know. So if you try sitting uh, quietly in in relative silence from time to time, you will begin to get the experience of what it means to sit with the music and what it means to sit without it. Got it. I understand and the you, difference. Yeah, and you see the difference. And uh, I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm a big music fan. I just, you know, I'll, I'll sometimes watch. I love the music channel now. On the, we got the new Google system on TV. They have a whole music channel. <laughs> and, I mean, you can go back and watch these videos and listen to these bands. People, you, you know, it's fantastic. It's addictive. <laughs> Any other questions for Sensei? Sensei, I like the way that this whole idea of stillness I like the very, very last phrase on all these different translations that say the one I want for an epitaph on star, but they say it differently on some of these others. The master doesn't seek fulfillment, not seeking, not expecting. She is present and can welcome all things. That's just sitting in what's what is. That's the application of what we practice on the cushion, right? Yep. And the implication is that is what you're looking for. Yeah. But it doesn't look like it, you know. So the sitting still, uh, there's another meaning of mokarai, which is silence is thunder. That's where we get our silent thunder order from. So it means that the silence in Zen, and this relates to what Marla was asking or talking about, the silence in Zen is not the absence of sound. The silence is in the sound. And the sound is in the silence. So Mokara is kind of a resolution of all these apparent dichotomies or opposites. They're not really, they're not really that way. Mm, that's good. Just like emptying the mind of thoughts, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, your thoughts, your monkey is trying to, is your friend, is trying to protect you. You know, and the thoughts that come up, they're, you would really want to listen to him <laughs> pretty much, you know, but, but after you hear the same thought coming around again and again and again, the monkey's playing the top 10 hits, you know, about all the things <laughs> you don't like about yourself. <laughs> and, and you start thinking, well, yeah, we've been here before. Uh, can we move on? You know, 
Yeah, what's the <laughs> what's the statistic? Ninety. It's in the high nineties. Ninety eight, ninety nine percent of your thoughts are repetitive. Right. I mean, it's a, almost right. all of your thoughts are repetitive. And not they can't, from my understanding, the theoretical perspective, they cannot possibly be actually repetitive. But they're they're similar. They're close. They're okay. the same category of thought, same kind of thought. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, you know, family, work, money, Zen, they're categories. And some teachers say just create mental pigeonholes and just stick them in the right pigeonhole every time a thought comes up. If you're at Einstein, you may have a lot of pigeonholes, but most of us only have about a dozen categories. And then you advocate keeping a legal pad or something to where if there's something coming. Yeah, up, if you have we're all, since they said your projects are important, you know, if we're all if we're all engaged in projects and uh, you may have an aha or eureka moment when you're sitting in Zazen become or meditation because you become so clear, you know, and, and actually when you're falling asleep, too. So you might want to keep your notepad next to your bed when you wake up like the Dottis did, the Surrealists did this and uh, kept track of their dreams, for instance. But yeah, every once in a while, I have a kind of, aha, oh, that's how to build that joint, you know, of something I'm trying to make or build or how, some problem I'm having painting. Uh, it'll become clear. And you don't want to sit there and worry about it. So if you just jot it down, a few key words, you'll get back to that later. Then you can get back to your meditation. Mm. Thank you. These are all matters of balance, I think. Vacillation from this to that and you know, becoming patient with it and allowing yourself to sort of land in the middle. If someone's starting and we, and I've got a link in the show notes that I'll have to your beginner meditation criteria and your beginner meditation instruction. But for someone who's starting uh, time-wise, what, what's your suggestion? I, you know, since I said five, say five minutes, five minutes, Buddha, sit a half hour, Buddha for half hour, wouldn't you rather be Buddha all day? So um, make it easy on yourself, like the old song says, you know, don't, don't, don't beat yourself up over this. Make, let this be its own thing. Don't do it the way you do everything else, where it's a must. You set yourself up for failure, you know, if you, do, if you set up, uh, I have to sit an hour every day. I have to sit in the morning. It's not a have to or must. It must do. It's a we get to do this when we get to do it. So I recommend interval training. It's like every chance you get, if you're stressing out, uh, whether you're driving on the expressway, sitting at your desk at the office, whatever you're doing, just take a moment, sit up straight, breathe deep. <laughs> you know? if, and the practicing meditation uh, is like uh, the, the intense focus of it. You can't you can't sit twenty four seven unless you're in a monastery, and even then that's that's a very difficult. Uh, but you can sit more. But the way you want to sit more is when you're sitting. You want to sit more when you're sitting, qualitatively more, not necessarily quantitatively. Now, what it's like they say if you don't if you hate filing paperwork, just tell yourself I'm going to file paper for five minutes. You know. And then you might find yourself filing paperwork for 15 minutes. Similarly, with something like Zazen, which we have a natural resistance to this idea that we have to do something as stupid as sitting still for long periods of time just to get back to normal. And in the Zendo, having somebody hit us with a stick, you know, I mean, <laughs> that's pretty... Uh, <laughs> we resent that and resist it. And so it's natural, but... Just sort of trick yourself into fitting it in. If you wait, when you wake up in the morning, instead of jumping up in a panic and running around, I have a little hard pillow that I have next to my bed. I slide it under me. I just sit on the side of the bed for a few minutes, especially if I wake up at four o'clock and when I have to go to the bathroom and come back, I can't fall asleep right away. I just wrap the blanket around me and I sit up on the side of the bed for a while. Pretty soon I'm yawning and, you know, relaxing and breathing deeply and then it's easy to lie down and go to sleep or if you say you want i would like to do 60 minutes a day six oh well then do six tens 10 minutes at a time you can sit up at your desk nobody will notice um 
you can do four 15s, you know, interval training, do it between other things. And the more you do that, the more I think you'll find the halo effect coming into play that, that as you're driving on the expressway and you begin, you feel the stress starting to build, you will have an automatic jujitsu type of trigger in the mind. You'll find yourself sitting up straight and breathing deeper automatic. You don't even have to think about it. Mm-hmm. Motor muscle memory kicks in. Your body takes over. It's like training yourself in martial arts or anything else or like police training. When the crisis is on, you don't have to think. It's just automatic. Mm-hmm. That's what starts happening in, in meditation practice. That's good. Thank you. So it becomes more and more 24-7. It becomes more and more your normal state of awareness or however you want to think of it or like a child yeah yeah any other comments on this verse from a zen you did want to comment on the verse what line did you want to comment on was um, the toward the end yeah it was that the idea that um those who have tall doll, with nothing else yeah the seemingly empty never full seemingly old they're beyond the reach of birth and death the, the one just before that in the star, the course of nature, muddy water becomes clear through the unfolding right. of life, man reaches perfection. That the idea that that when we uh, uh yep. that when we allow the mud to settle, the answer shows without how yep. how is, is that something that resonates with you and yeah, how, some how, other ones. Oh yes. Go ahead. Something resonates with me and what? It, how, how that verse in general resonates with you personally from your own practice oh yeah and there, there's a great line in one of the chinese poems where it says uh, uh on the on the verge of awakening uh, if you want to follow in the ancient if you want to follow in the ancient of uh, the pa- ancient the sages ancient path please observe the sages of the past one on, and this is referring to a story about Shakyamuni, one of the Jatakatiyas. One, one on the verge of realizing the Buddha way contemplated a tree for 10 kalpas. Then it goes on to say, like a battle scarred tiger, like a horse with shanks gone gray. So I think that's very similar to this idea that through the unfolding of life, you know, if you're the tiger and you have all these battle scars, or you're the horse and your shanks have, already, have gone gray through, through life. You know, you are maturing in the spiritual sense. And uh, contemplating the tree is like for 10 kalpas, a kalpa is an infinitely long time. We have no idea what a tree is. So (laughs) you could contemplate it a long time. Mm. Reading the other one, the version in in, um, Dyer's book, he says, but the muddiest water clears as it is stilled. And out of that stillness, life arises. Now, early on, Buddha had a metaphor, analogy. He said, a jar of silty or turbid, turbid is the word they use, turbid water, silty water, like uh, gray water from dishwashing or whatever. You can't see through it. And he said, if you, you know, and Thich Nhat Hanh quotes this without attribution. If you, if you leave it on the shelf and don't bother it, the silt will eventually settle to the bottom. And then the water becomes clear and you can see through it. So this is a metaphor for the mind. If you keep shaking up the jar, uh, it just stays gray. It stays, you can't see. So the idea is you have to let things settle. You have to let everything settle. And as I said, this is like you were when a child, when you were a child, if you went out by yourself and you're three or four years old and you sit out on the lawn and you're just, you're just there, you just taking it all in you're looking around and the bees are buzzing and the you know whatever's happening you don't have much thought about it you're just there and uh so i think that's the kind of natural original primordial mind bare awareness is what it's often referred to in zen bare awareness that we return to in uh in our meditative practice and Taoism is pointing right at that it it speaks of the Tao, interestingly, especially in this verse. Many people, I think, conceive of the Tao as being this universal force that's sort of outside, and you either get in line with it or you're going to get run over with it, by it, you know. Uh, but this is saying the Tao is flowing through you. 
which is an important concept in Zen, the ki, life force, chi or ki. Uh, there are exercises that you can do that are prescribed where you're, the key of your body, and in martial arts as well, the key of your body starts to tap the universal key. And so the flow from the key inside your body to the universal key outside your body is now uninhibited. And so it, it, it's, it's healing. It's a healing process, according to Zen. So I think this is very similar to talking about the Tao as being this universal force. But guess what? That's the force that's inside you. That is you. That is your life force. We're not lacking anything, are we? Uh, imagination, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anything else from that, guys? We're approaching five very, uh, very quickly. So, Craig, quick hour. We have Curie. Curie's over on the far right end now. Okay. Uh, Curie's a new one, Sensei. I don't know if he's going to. Uh, he uh, This is second week. I don't know if he'll have anything for us or not. You have anything? Call him out. Call, call him out. <laughs> the only thing I kept thinking about was I grew up in Minnesota in my adolescence. So the thought of walking across a river uh, with ice on it, the fear of falling in was, uh, um, I know what that's like. And it was, uh, it's not like a, like a fear of a thought or something. It's like a natural alertness right. and fear to walk across that. And I just, I, you know, so you kind of, I, I can kind of, that, that one part just kind of hit me that, uh, yeah, I can kind of see some of these things and I know that one perfectly. Yeah. I grew up in Illinois and it's not quite as bad as fierce as Minnesota, but walking home from school, like in third grade, I had to go through a lot of woods uh, to walk into the township school in, in town. I used to, I, I actually went second grade. I was in a one room country schoolhouse, believe it or not, but coming home, I would often sit in the woods, just sit there in the cold and, and sort of absorb that chill. And it was a wonderful feeling of uh, being at home or something, even though you're out in the cold. I miss the cold of Chicago here in Atlanta. I don't think I do, but <laughs> They'll take you back, Sensei. If you ever want to go back, I'm sure they'll let you back. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I thought you meant the line about they are seeming, though seemingly old, they are beyond the reach of birth and death. As we get older, that? this becomes more and more a koan for us because we witness our own aging. And it says seemingly so, old, not old. They are, though seemingly old, they are beyond the reach of birth and death. Yeah. <laughs> so there is this idea in Zen, at least, and Taoism is a progenitor of Zen in China, that uh, you can die on the cushion. You can actually experience death. And uh, a lot of the old masters in Zen, at least, and probably similar in Taoism, uh, called it, called it. They called it when they were going to die. They knew when they were going to die. And uh, they would sit down and die surrounded by their students. So there's something about this uh, life and death issue, birth and death, in both Taoism and Buddhism that they're seen as, I think, inflection points in a continuum. Dogen has a lot to say about that. We can talk about sometime. Hmm. But our perspective on it is, well, wait a minute. You know, no, I'm I'm the one that's going to die here. You, that's there's cold comfort in anything philosophical about it. You know. So in Zen, we say, just sit down and face it, you know, don't, don't worry, don't, don't obsess, not morbid, not morbid, it's just realistic. What was it, the leading cause of uh, death is birth, right? Yeah, that's the number one cause, number one cause of death is birth. (laughs) Anything else for Sensei, guys? uh, Sensei's having fun today. Anything else for Sensei, guys, before we close? No, thank you so much. Yeah, As always. Today. Thank you. My pleasure. I mean that. Guys, if there's nothing else, then uh, we'll see y'all next week. Have a good week. Hello, this is Buddy C. I wanted to make you aware of several recovery-related resources that I've posted in the episode description. These resources include a list of recovery podcasts, a free sober meditation app, daily recovery email, shared Google recovery calendars, Hope you put some of these resources to use and have a great week. 
Thank you for listening to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends in recovery.